gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Mayor, ben Mayor Benjamin is, uh, is, is out of town, and so it's a uh, woman to defend. So, but we'll, we'll get started. Uh, all right, good afternoon. Mr. Rickerman? Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Badura? Here. Mr. Vine? Mr. Davis? Here. Mayor Benjamin? Thank you. Put the record on here. Mr. Oh, Mr. Rickerman. Now, you just jump right before I could respond. Well, I want to go over thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to get together to do the work of the city. Uh, inform our decisions, protect those that are not with us today and they're traveling, and maybe work in your, for your good always. Um, I I'll let you know that uh, Mayor Benjamin may be calling in during the uh, open session this evening. Ms. Krista. <laughs> As Krista comes forward, um, Mr. Davis, I'll announce it for the record, the Gills Creek Greenway discussion. Ms. Krista Hampton, Planning and Development Services Director. I'm sure we have some interested parties um, present with us today. And also, is John going to present? Krista, okay, and Mr. John Fellows as well with our Planning and Development Services Department. And as um, I'll let John go ahead and come up, yeah, this is actually going to be much shorter than it had originally been intended. Um, the reason being, we've been communicating with the Gulf Creek Watershed Association, um, had some very good conversations about um, some widths of the Greenway and some compromises to try to get to a place um, where, where it meets the city and the association's needs. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to John. Good afternoon. Um, as Chris mentioned, we have had a very good time. Can I yes. um, interrupt for a minute? Are we recorded? Can you pull the microphone closer to your to your mouth, John? Sure. Thank you. Um, is that open? Yeah, that's on. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. oh, no. I'm just waiting for it to make sure they can get there. Oh, that's on. They're on. Are they on? All right. Okay. Um, as, right. as Krista mentioned, um, we have had some ongoing conversations. These conversations actually have gone on for, for a number of months. Um, Valerie and I have had conversations as well as uh, Valerie and Krista talking about some of the, um, uh, the standards. And you'll recall we came to you in 2015 with some um, standards before really any of the Greenway planning came together, but we knew um, as staff that we need to have some something to um, be a guiding um, some standards and things. And then. Um, a few months later, okay, here we go. Uh, a few months, uh, a few years later, then you actually entered into an agreement with the county um, that uh, indicated what those dimensional uh, requirements were going to be. Um, and what we have learned um, through this process is that we had some very simple um, criteria, but there's a lot more um, nuanced um, things that go into a greenway. I think uh, the county and the PDT have learned a number of things about planning the greenway. We've certainly learned a lot about the green, uh, the Gills Creek corridor um, in particular, and some of the uh, constraints and things that we have. And so um, I think it was last week um, we had some conversations and I shared a uh, uh, an email to Valerie and to Gills Creek kind of outlining some of the things. I'm sure. sorry, just for the record, okay. describe who Valerie in full name and what does Valerie do when you're referencing Valerie? Sure. Um, Valerie Marcel, and she is with the uh, Hills <laughs> Creek um, um, Association. Um, she's been our main contact with that um, nonprofit here in um, Columbia. And so um, when we have had these conversations, basically last week we kind of put into uh, text some of the things we were going to look at. In fact, staff. Um, a while back actually started looking at the standards that we brought to you knowing that we needed to update some of them. We've seen some, um, had some partners, had a lot of conversations. So when I say staff, I also want to clarify it's a partnership between um, parks and engineering and planning and public works. And um, so all of those departments actually have been um, at the discussion table um, discussing um, things as long-term maintenance, um, uh, logistics of changing a light bulb, um, all sorts of things like that. And then we've also um, talked to Gales Creek to understand their concerns. And so um, some of the things that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be coming back to you shortly, probably in a few weeks to sometime in August, um, with some revised um, standards. 
is looking at some things for flexibility, um, because before we had kind of one width, but we didn't really consider, for instance, um, those side connecting trails. So it's sort of like if you think about a road, sometimes you have an arterial road that's five lanes, but then you have that side street that's only two, and so we really don't need um, the width to make those connections from neighborhoods to the larger uh, dimensions, but that agreement between the city and the county actually had just one dimension, and so they've just been working with one dimension um, from that perspective. So there'll be some cost savings there, and um, also um, a little bit of a different experience when you go from the neighborhood to the larger trail. We've also um, talked to them about reducing the width from railing to railing to be 12 feet um, along the boardwalk area, as well as some of the uh, trail areas. And then um, we've also had some conversations about the area along uh, Croson Road. It's a kind of a, um, interesting urban area, and um, in our conversations we need to be able to, the design needs to have flexibility um, because there's some constraints, um, there's an urban condition, um, we're next to a road, we have private kind of property, we have a, a kind of steep drop off into Gills Creek, um, and so we'll try to craft some language that then can be incorporated and that when the penny's designing um, the, um, uh, the trail, uh, those can be considered. And we're also going to look for some exceptions because we know um, that whatever standards we come up to with at some point, whether it's with Gills Creek or Rocky Branch or Smith Branch or something like that, there's going to be that unique situation that needs um, something slightly different um, as the solution. Um, and so we'll have some built-in exceptions um, that will allow for some flexibility that are maybe unforeseen. Um, and so we're going to be working on, staff will be working on that, and then we're going to engage in a few weeks with um, the Gills Creek Water Center Association to have them review the comments, and then we'll come back to you um, after there's been some revisions and both uh, groups have gone back and forth, um, and then we'll be able to present it more in detail, some of those changes to, to all of you, and then we could um, hand that off to the county. So. John, in, in the original county meetings, when the penny dollars were being appropriated, they, they had a plan laid out, and we were told that we can't make any changes, that, that everything is solid the way it is. Have they told you, you can you, we can make these changes? So um, there are staff here from the PDT, so I don't know, totally want to speak for them, but my understanding um, all the way through the process, and I think it was the understanding of, of other city staff, is that, for instance, if there is a particular segment um, of a road improvement or a sidewalk over a greenway, and it was supposed to go from point A to point B, that was not flexible, um, that that was the section. So they couldn't go an extra block, and they couldn't, they could certainly go less, but they certainly couldn't go bigger, and they couldn't switch it to um, three streets over or something like that. But my understanding is that um, the details in terms of um, some of those other types of um, construction type details are not part of that referendum. So those things have been um, developed over time um, to be able to construct those. Um, for instance, um, I think with Gills Creek, um, I don't think at the ref time of referendum anyone had any idea of how much boardwalk or how much pavement there might be. That wasn't probably even determined until maybe within the last year when all the survey and everything and uplands and lowlands and everything was actually um, detailed I, I out. I think they were, if somebody's here who could, could you know, confirm that for us, but and it was pretty specific is that, you know, the plan is the plan, you know, we have these two variations and this is the cost and, you know, we can't do anything to change that cost. So I just want to make sure that we're not spinning our wheels here on something that, that we have to have somebody else agree to or, or, or not. Um, well, I mean, I need, I, I, I think we need somebody from PDT to do that. Can you come up to the mic? Yeah. And then if you can just state your name for the record, that'd be great. Hi, council members, and um, my name is Amy Blizzard, and I'm the Deputy Program Administrator for the Penny Sites <coughs> for the Bike Pet Greenway Program. So, and thank you for your question because there is, um, you know, a lot of confusion over what we can change and can't. It, what John said is absolutely correct though. The termite or the scope of the project is sort of fixed or it is fixed. But when it comes down to things like design, um, which comes much later, you know, after the referendum, 
there are always going to have to be some design changes that will be made. In fact, we don't even have construction plans at the very beginning. That's the process that we've been going through for the last few years. And there are going to always be some adjustments that you'll have to make after you get geotechnical um, information, the soils information, and like John said, things like um, habitats, and wetlands, and stuff like that. So he was absolutely right, and it is something that we have been trying to help coordinate between the Watershed Association and the county to try to get the project to where it's most appropriate for the environment there. So. Do we have contingency built into that budget? Because, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, things have changed and, you know, we don't want to go halfway on a project and not get it completed. Do we have a contingency for that? All of our projects have some base contingency as far as the cost. Um, and throughout the process, as the design changes, we look at the estimates, we look at what, what we're actually facing in dollars. So, yes, to answer your question. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's important because obviously, you know, our concern will be as things move along, we don't have extra funding to to fund that project at this point. We, you know, we're, we're struggling to, to come up with the maintenance money that we're gonna be needed at the end. So we wanna make sure that, you know, whatever happens, it's going to be able to go because I think people are waiting at this point. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll go after you. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to compliment Valerie and John and all the people who were involved in the compromise. I think that's the way government should work. Uh, this section of the Greenway is a very important section. Uh, the reduction from 14 to 12 feet, I think, uh, according to my conversation with David Beatty will allow us to get to Timberlake, Timberland, which is key. You cannot terminate this thing at Beecliff. Beecliff is a neighborhood that's not built for the traffic that I think that the Greenway will have. So we need to make that a spur, as John called in his email, and have the main boardwalk go down to where you get Timberland. Uh, I, I'm pleased that we recognize that there's got to be some flexibility and compliment Valerie and John and all the team for working things out. And uh, following that, that point that uh, Councilman Duvall has mentioned, what are the cost uh, savings from 14 foot width to a 12 foot width or 10 foot width? I mean, does it matter if you can go down as low as 10 feet instead of 12 feet uh, yeah. to extend the, the track or is it? Yeah, absolutely. It will provide some savings. Anytime that you can you know, reduce the width, you're talking about the width of the concrete, the width of the, that has to be poured, or the width of the boardwalks that have to be bought and you know, installed. Um, from some of our estimates, we see per linear foot, it would, it's about a, um, about 10, between 10 and $50 a linear foot, depending on the material and depending on if it's high or low. It may not seem like very much, but when you take something that's 3.2 miles or, um, you know, it is a substantial greenway, the savings really do add up. And like you had alluded to, it would allow us to actually get an extra about 2,500 feet um, the boardwalk, which about a half a mile more. So, and giving us a terminus that's a, lo a logical terminus. So is that a half a mile for a three and a half mile? <coughs> it would add to that, yeah, the three point two. Yeah. So what is this? What is it? It's right now. It's, it's under one mile. Yeah, my apologies. I was thinking of all three phases. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah, my my apologies. Thank you. So for three and a half mile, after we de decrease the width, it's you get an extra almost almost an, an extra mile of length to connect it. So, and why are we since we're talking about adjustment on the design and, and pathway from 14 foot to 12 foot, mm -hmm. why not 10 foot? So staff did discuss, discuss that. There certainly are paths out there that are 8 feet and 10 feet, but um, across the country for the last 20 or 30 years as uh, greenways have been built, uh, they actually uh, see a lot more volume in the end. And so what communities have had to, had to do, they've actually had to go and they've actually had to expand those because the volume of people using the greenway actually exceeds and they start trampling the sides. The, uh, the sides of the asphalt of the road starts to crumble because of the traffic and then they, they, and it becomes a, a maintenance issue. And so um, a number of years ago when we did the Divine Street Fort Jackson uh, plan, we actually took a trip up to 
um, Charlotte to learn about the Little Sugar Creek Trail. We actually learned from their designers some of the things that they had. So uh, when we came back and we started looking at the Greenway system here, we, one of the things staff wants to make sure is that we don't so design it so narrowly just for the sake of length that all of a sudden we're going to end up with this population using the trail and people aren't going to fit. It's sort of a, so I can kind of make the relationship of if you know you need a four-lane road to handle the traffic of cars, you know that if you only build a two-lane road, you're going to have congestion and people are going to complain about it. And so there is sort of that dimension. Uh, being on the Rosewood um, side of the creek, and particularly when you get past Timberlane, there's a lot of roads and the connect connection to Rosewood connects. So people can actually walk and ride their bike, and then they'd be able to go north um, on this greenway and go to Whole Foods and things like that. And so. Um, we anticipate that, that there will be a, a number of users. And so um, the other thing is this boardwalk, for a large portion of it, is going to be a high boardwalk. So when you're on a trail and it's paved, you have the, the grass as a shoulder. So if you do get a little bit of congestion, people can kind of step to the side or that kind of thing. But when you're on a boardwalk and you have railings, there's really nowhere for you to go. And the other um, component of the design is that um, one of the requirements from the um, from the city is to have them loop the trail illuminated as well as having call boxes. And so when you start introducing the light poles within that 12 foot space, then that's an extra um, two feet by the time you put the base in. Same thing with the call box. So at those points, you actually start to um, have a little bit of a, um, a narrow width. Now, granted, that's not a long width, but it, you're, you're going to have these portions where they go back and forth. And if you ever um, parse finds that they need to put more trash cans out there, that's going to be within that space. And then if there's a call that they're in the plans. There are no benches on the on the greenway, but we know for our older population, um, whether it's a street um, or a trail, often um, they will use it if there's places to rest, um, but they will tend not to use it if there's not. So if we think about it in the future, if we ever have to put benches on the trail, that also you know bench takes up three feet. Um, so um, you're going to be within those railings, and so we we feel that 12 um, provides. Um, the width for volume as well as all those other components that are going to be in that space. Um, so we think that's a, a good compromise and it will get us to a better location um, for access um, from that perspective. So. Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah. So, so John, I really done your homework. So that yeah. Valerie would like to speak after you. Is that very good? I'd just like to um, oh, okay. have to use the microphone. Yeah. I'm Valerie Marcel, and um, I, I believe in transparency, and I think that costs are really important, a really important factor to consider. And I've been trying for a long time to get estimates for the greenway and different widths for boardwalk, and finally, just in the last couple of weeks, I've gotten some estimates from a couple of different sources. Um, one of for the eight foot wide boardwalk that um, has been built on the Saluda Trail, and then also the Penny has provided estimates per linear foot for um, a 10 foot width and a 14 foot width. Right? It didn't get a 12 foot width. I think at the time I was I was advocating for a 10 foot width, so we didn't get the 12 foot. But I have some handouts here I'd just like to share. I'm going to pass those out. Um, and I, I'm still, I'm willing to, you know, go with this compromise. It, it, but I, I want everybody to understand that the way I'm uh, running numbers, um, the penny has said that um, a 14-foot wide high boardwalk would cost $1,100 per linear foot. That would end up for the length of boardwalk that we're dealing with being um, about $3,630,000. That is probably twice what's allowed for in the budget um, that exists within the Penny program for that, for that greenway. Um, just, and that's just for the boardwalk, and that's just construction costs. It's not labor and other things. So I don't know what the Penny has been planning, but that's the number they gave me. Um, if we go down to a 10 foot width, and oh, let's, it's, it's $900 per linear foot. I don't have the numbers as you can see here for 12 foot width because I didn't ask for that at the time. 
I'm assuming that 12 foot would be about 1,000 feet. That would be the split between 900 and 1,100. Um, if, we, if we went to 12 feet, it's still over $3 million. Um, I'm not sure, again, if I'm running those numbers right. I use my calculator um, and use the figures that were given to me. Um, so I, I'm not sure where that goes. Um, a 10 foot wide boardwalk would be under 3 million. It gets a little bit closer to what the budget is. The budget for that boardwalk right now for construction is under $2 million. It's about, correct me, but I think 1,800,000, something like that. Um, so I, I'm really not sure what we're dealing with, but the Penny has been planning this um, Boardwalk from Fort Jackson Boulevard to Michael Lane, which is just under a mile, saying that we can build that at 14 feet wide. So I, I'm not sure where the discrepancy is. I'm just giving you figures. I would love more figures, better figures, and that's oops, I just lost. that's why I'm throwing this out. I just lost the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know. I, this may be a good time to uh, formulate a letter to to Ms. Penny, you know, and I think we've all talked about it before, but you know, it may be time for the Penny to reevaluate all the projects and rearrange because I think this project originally had a stint going into King's Grant and other places, which is not going. Obviously, you know, and should that funding be switched to that other, I, I think this is a good yeah. time to have a conversation with the, with the with any folks. I know there's going to be some transition, so it's kind of, you know, a unique time in the next six months. But I think the committee, a request for the committee to reevaluate the project and make sure that A, they have complete funding maybe reprioritize them, I think would be in the best interest of all the citizens of Richland County at this point. Because we're clearly with, with the funding source as quickly as it's moving and this and that, we're not going to be able to accomplish. So having the priority and really trying to get the biggest bang for the buck for the citizens is, is and I think this, from Jackson Boulevard, I think even at one point we figured out we, if we did it right, we could get all the way to the trestle, I think, or yes. close to it. Yeah. Um, Are so there any it, type of approvals needed at this point from the, by the PDT from the city other than this agreement on the lift? So, um, to answer the, both questions, um, in terms of other agreements, um, so we would have to, uh, to, to uh, adapt or modify the width, we would have to re-modify um, that agreement with the county. Um, and my understanding is that, that would be the only um, transactional document we would need to um, address um, and then attach the new standards to that document. To answer um, Councilman Rickman's question, um, last um, Thursday, I believe it was, I was at a meeting at the county and David Beatty provided a brief update on some of the next steps that the county plans on taking. Um, I'll try to summarize it, but if I correct it, if I mess up on any of those, off of memory, um, hopefully one of the people from the PET will respond, but I believe um, County Council has a number of meetings coming up here, one in August, uh, um, I think end of July, and then um, in August, and then the um, uh, following meeting in August. And at one of those meetings, um, they were going to take up the conversation of um, moving um, the uh, other areas of Gills Creek to this particular corridor from uh, Fort Jackson. So the money from King's Grant and from um, by, um, by the lake, um, those areas would be reallocated to this particular project, which then would help fund it um, definitely through timber and line, if not um, maybe even a little further. But that's to be yet to be. But they have, they have to recruit, they have to change that from a policy standpoint. And my understanding is because of the Supreme Court case and everything that's going on, they have to reprioritize everything I believe and do that. a public meeting about that. And I think that's, we, we should write a letter of support on that, that happening is what I'm getting at. Is there anything else to add? That's the correct. 
So they would have all the trails design and or locations for from the penny tax program? Uh, no, my understanding is that um, so they have um, over the last uh, 12 months they have finished up all their public meetings on all the different greenways. So um, the uh, they've had public meetings on Rocky Branch and Crane Creek and Smith Branch. Um, Gills Creek happened a, a while ago. They also had some other um, public meetings for some of the greenways that were that are solely in the county and um, received community feedback from that. And so very similar to Gills Creek, there are some portions that the community supported, some portions um, the community didn't support. And so my understanding is on the 23rd, what they'll do is they're going to actually re-prioritize uh, or reallocate however they do, whatever word I guess it is, but some items that were on the original list would not be um, moved forward for construction, and then those other ones that were had public support would be moved forward um, for construction. And then at that point, um, I would guess sometime after uh, the transition, those other greenways that have not had any designs, the county would start doing the construction drawings and um, items like that. I think that's the summary that I, of my understanding. Thank you, John. So, um, what I'm hearing, I need to <coughs> communicate with them status of modifications, changes. So, well, you won't do that you until and, after. Well, I, what I'm hearing is uh, some of it has been done, but I don't know that everybody knows. The, the plan that I set forth with uh, the Gills Creek Association was that over the next um, few weeks, um, staff was going to convene, we actually have a meeting on the calendar for tomorrow for us to um, try to um, get through uh, drafting um, some more detailed guidelines and um, the exception section and things like that. And then we're going to um, give it to Gills Creek for a few days to, to um, for them to review. And then we we're gonna come together as a group um, and review those documents and then once um, there was um, consensus um, on those things, and if there was a consensus, something we'll, we'll bring that up to you and say, you know, there's this something that needs to be balanced there. But um, we hope there'll be consensus, and then we're gonna bring it back to you in a work session um, for you to consider. And then the idea would be that those um, formal documents between the city and the county would come to uh, council. And then uh, what happened last time was Ms. Wilson, I believe, sent a letter over to the county. But if you wanted to send a, a letter now. Um, in support of their rec their uh, actions on the 23rd, that probably would be something that could also be done. Uh, but I think we need a good, we're gonna get it, need a, uh, we probably won't be able to see you until, uh, with those recommendations until probably um, one of your August meetings. We just need a, a number of weeks. That's, John, that's, that's, Gil, that's Gil Creek, but I think we're talking about an overview. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. John, I guess my, my concern is this, is that going to give us enough time to collaborate not only with the county and with the, the association and all those persons involved, enough time to come and on the 23rd uh, reasonably uh, bring this back to us on the 23rd? So um, I think there's two different things that I, if I confuse it, I think there's the process that the county is going through and they're going to have that at their meeting on the 23rd. And that is something that um, is exclusive of Gills Creek. They're just basically going to decide which greenways they're going forward with and which one's not. I believe uh, there is support for a portion of Rocky Branch and Smith Branch and a little bit of Crane Creek in the city and then um, obviously Gills Creek. But there's some other ones that um, are fully the counties, and that's what they'll be dealing with on the 23rd. Um, uh, from our end, with the des design standards, that is um, something we would um, not have done by the 23rd. We would need about a, uh, a month or so um, to collaborate and then bring it back to you. 
Um, and then um, late August, early September, or something like that, that's when you can right. communicate that, those dimensional standards. And we'll obviously, in the process, we're going to engage with the, um, with the uh, design team um, over at the county to make sure that um, they're looped into. So. so do you all want us to reiterate the letters we've already sent regarding prioritization of city projects to the county before their meeting next week? Is that what I'm hearing? I, think I don't know if it's next week. Yeah, no. The county's yeah, meeting is next meeting. week. Right. Yeah, I didn't realize the county was meeting I in their off session. So. They usually meet during the summer. But, yeah, I think it's but if they are, I mean, you yeah, want to see that. It's not city projects. I think it's in general, the overall, because every piece of that overall plan budget affects every other piece, especially with the changes that have happened. And you know the reality is the money's coming in quicker, costs have gone up, so there hasn't been a true balance of that since then. So you know it, it would be worth just to encourage them. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. And make it three. So we get the so, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's going to be a letter saying yeah. what y'all are reporting okay. or whatever um, it's worth. Update after that meeting. To see what projects, what they're moving on, and that kind of thing. Um, if, you, if you'd like an update, we can certainly after that meeting. I'm sure the um, the county team will provide us whatever minutes or whatever the action was, and we can um, certainly send you, Thank you an email update. Okay, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Ready to go to the next item? <laughs> you done with this item, Ms. Brooks? I'm hiding over here. All right, our second item, um, Krista's up a lot for this and her staff for this uh, work session, is a text amendment for eating and drinking establishments, which is on your agenda for tonight. And we wanted to make sure that um, council had the opportunity to ask any questions of staff and seek clarifications. And Rachel, are there any administrator will assist me with this. Um, the provisions that are coming to you this evening are included in the proposed new code, but they are coming forward earlier to help alleviate some of the confusion that's happened um, with regard to eating and drinking establishments. And um, there are very, three very clear categorizations, and I'll let Rachel kind of describe those to you. Good afternoon. So we're breaking it down instead of having it restaurants and drinking places. We have eating establishments only, which the example I give is a McDonald's. So they're open at various hours of the day, but they do not serve alcohol. We have eating and drinking type one, which encompasses a mix of restaurants, bars, just places that do serve alcohol, but the cutoff is midnight. So we're looking really at hours of operation now. Type two is midnight and later. So if they're open until 12.05, they fall under type two. And they have to get a special exception from the Board of Zoning Appeals. And they also have to present a great deal of information up front before they even go to the board. Wow. And that's business plan and all of that. Why 12 to two when state law is two? We don't have the closing time set in there, so if they go and get an extended hours permit, that's one thing. Well, I'm, I'm, but I'm the midnight cutoff. The cut difference off. between 12 and 2, how, how do we. Uh, the midnight sure. cutoff will encompass more of those late night places that have been more of an issue and that neighborhoods have wanted to have more of an opinion on. So in certain districts, it'll bring it before the board to go over. A proliferation so if there's five places in a row that are open until two in the morning that's what they're going to be looking at whereas an Applebee's for example can sometimes be open till midnight right but they would fall under take one okay. so that's just we originally had it at 11 p.m. and we pushed it to midnight well we're becoming an 18 one. hour city so yeah know, we have to plan that so, and I mean, some places will come before the borders and appeals and we'll be fine, but we're gathering all that information up front so that just more transparent when the packets are published for the board, everyone in the neighborhoods can see 
what's coming. And it also gives staff an opportunity to really build a portfolio of what these businesses are. Yeah, I, so I've got a couple of them. Uh, <clears throat> one, I noticed in here that uh, restaurants are, are going to be allowed in C2 zone properties. Did I read that right or not? Yeah, and they currently are. They currently are. With a special exception with Bozo or not? Um, there's a sizing requirement currently in C2 that will remain of the 5,000. 5, if they go above that, it's a special we'll exception. But type 1 is allowed outright if it's within that sizing quota. And that is the fast food? Fast McDonald's. food, the ones that open until midnight. Okay. Uh, the other question I have <clears throat> is on the patio on the 200 feet uh, distance between RS1, RS2, RS3, RG1, RG2. Is the 250 feet um, limitation from an outdoor seating to RS1, is that from the edge of the, the outside seating, the building, the property line? Where does that come? I mean, you have to, I mean, it's just not clear in this ordinance. It'll be from the um, outside edge of the outdoor seating to the property line. That's the part that I have heartache with. Because we're, we, we, we just got through talking about greenways. We're talking about walkability. We're trying to create corridors where people can live and eat. How is that gonna affect the Vista? Or at five points, if we, we have developers come in and put restaurants and patty and they got rid They're not. Today, and the neighborhoods next to it, I mean, there are a lot of neighborhoods that are growing who people want to walk and go eat in their neighborhood and I think this is going to create some restrictive problems should should the patio be by special exception not by a, a rule of, of 200 feet or 250 because I mean that you could go in Rosewood and Shannon right now and you, you would eliminate people in today's thing and it does not call in there for anybody being grandfathered. So I mean they if it's existing we're not gonna go get them and make them shut it down. But, it needs to be clear. but it would be if they expanded it and the Vista for example doesn't back up. But it to says any improvement. Well, what, what if you put a new rail that's an improvement. Then you're you're cut I mean that's the way it reads. For the type two what falls under that for, for that the type 2 comes under the special exception for improvements, expansions, and everything like that. And I want to clarify, outdoor seating is permitted. It's just a, it just has to be further than 250 from the red. So you can have your out, you can have your establishment. It's just where you put your patio. You want to put it at least 250 feet away from the parcel. But why? I mean, where? where? So if I'm in my backyard in my house. Right, but if you're living next door to a commercial district, I mean, that's... But a you, you know, you know what you're, if you're moved next door to, I don't know, pick a restaurant there and they have outdoor, I mean, you've made that decision. You, you, I mean, what, what I'm hearing you do is you're handicapping the ability for people to create an atmosphere that, that people want to walk to and be part of a neighborhood Absolutely by restriction. Not. Well, that it does is it. because you're putting you know, it by foot. That, that is the antithesis of what you try to do in planning, which is walkable neighborhoods. What we're trying to do is encourage outdoor dining, but for them to place it generally towards the street as opposed to in the back of their property. So why don't we just say that instead of putting a foot on it? Why don't you just say because... You can't anticipate... You can't well, it's anticipate not because you can measure it from six different locations. It is the edge. Maybe it's a, from, from the front, the front door. door. Right, so we're talking about from the patio, Sometimes from the edge of the patio to the parcel line. So 250 feet, that's not even a half of a block outside here, from, from the edge of someone's residential parcel to this. And this is for new development. So if I buy a parcel that's adjacent to a commercial property, um, of which I'm very familiar, um, <laughs> then, and it's, a, it's an office, yeah, that's cool. But if it converts to a restaurant and they want to put a patio on the back, that may not be. And I, you know, I understand that it's commercial, but we, we are putting these protections in just to make sure it's an easy, because you can bet they'll be back here talking to y'all about the fact of the noise and perhaps the But that's why, I, I, to me, it almost makes sense to make it a, that it's a special exception. 
so that 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 you have to put out a, a real plan along with you know all the criteria that goes with that instead of just saying it's two. I mean, I don't like the two hundred fifty. I think it should be longer. But is it four hundred feet now? There are no. No, there are no restrictions. And where is the four hundred? You're, you're mixing that's it up with your other That's for the That's what I looked at. Yeah, that's in the current. <laughs> so, so let me let me let me just. I, I mean, Jim's I, written I, enough about I, that. I know. So to bring that up. I, I've 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 done restaurants all my life. Just about. I mean, I, it, it is impossible to uh, locate a deck or an outside seating front of a building or back of the building. It just it just depends on the the demand and and, and the growth of the business and everything else. I, I'm not comfortable with 250 feet from the edge of the patio. I mean, I, I'm not very comfortable with that at all. Number one, number two, I don't think it's very clear to hear that all the ones that is in existence ran is grandfathered in. Uh, we need to make that specific because otherwise you're going to close half the restaurants in, in the city. Uh, the number three is um, on some of the requirements on here for the special exceptions that requiring uh, restaurants to bring you kitchen equipment, staffing schedule, days of hours, a lot of that stuff is already within the DHAP permit. You, you're just given another, you're giving them another step, another red tape for businesses to open up and start making revenue and start operating. I just think some of that needs to be cleaned up a little bit more if that's possible. I, I, I'm definitely, I'm gonna urge and support um, grandfathered in quote in here that 250 feet has to be rediscussed and maybe look at the exact location where the 250 feet comes or maybe more and then maybe some of these other requirements that you guys require restaurant owners to do they've already done with DHAC or any other uh, government agency to, to qualify so um, I think this is my three concerns in here more than anything else but if you tell me C2 is already in existence with special exceptions and stuff like that you know okay I believe you on that. So, and just to follow up on those requirements that you referenced, um, those are specifically for the Type Two ones when they're coming for a special exception. And just to give you some back down, background of how we handle it now, when someone comes in for a restaurant or a drinking establishment, I ask them for all of that information in making my decision anyway. So it's just putting it down in writing that they have to give me the business plan and all that information because it builds a record so that if they begin to operate in a different manner than what they presented to the board when they go for a special exception, we have that information. But do we require that of all businesses? No. Did they submit a, a, a business plan? I because can, if I'm unable to determine really what their use but, is I mean, or what their law, specific is that a requirement is? in the city of Columbia? No, it's not. No, no it's not. So why are we, why are we going after one industry. I mean, this is to me selective and, and, and it gives me heartburn. It, it, it does because models change, businesses change. You have to change your hours if the business isn't there and, and all the other things. And then they're gonna have to come back and get a, a, a letter from you that it's okay. We don't do that with law offices. We don't do that with non-tax paying entities. We don't do that with other folks. Y'all, I think we're, I think we're trying. Whoa, 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 time out. This is not bars. This isn't bars. Not bars. Okay, guys. Not, this isn't but bars. It, it, I mean, don't, don't it, muck up the issue. Let's talk about the facts. But Mike says that they already do this to be it. If they already got the information, well, why is it not DHEC doesn't require you to give them a business plan. They you have to give them a kitchen plan. That yeah, they have and to that's what they got in here: kitchen equipment, menu, park. I mean, that's yeah. it's. I mean, if DHEC already requires that, there's no reason for you. I to mean, we don't ask the vaping CBD guys to put staffing schedule. We have required okay. business plans of other businesses just to ensure if if it's for instance a massage parlor recently we asked for. But but they don't have. Technically, they don't have to give it to me because it's not a requirement by the city. That's what I've been told. Am I correct? That's what it was. I mean, that's what you just what? said. So this is what I have a problem is that we, we're, we're putting it in there as a requirement for folks to do that. I think having, having your drawings, having your 
you know, your all the things that you need, your DX, that's conditions that we have to do. But asking somebody for their business plan and this and two, I mean, if we're not going to do it for everybody, we're not doing it for one industry. I mean, I just, I, you know, okay, um, those guys selling, you know, open up a store and they're selling, they start off selling candles and then they're selling water bombs and vaping like things. We don't go shut them down. We don't go back and do it. But we're picking on a, a, a certain industry. Understood. What you well, please understand where we've been coming from with this is is a lot of a lot of um, critique and focus on how we've been permitting businesses, um, especially in the hospitality districts. So we are responding to that, and we understand your concern. Um, if it's the will of council, we will remove it. Why don't can, we, can, can, I, can I just make a statement? Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay. I, I, I appreciate everything y'all doing. I, we, we, let, me, let me just be clear. We are not uh, upset about your hard work and everything that you brought to us. We, 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 please understand us. We love everything you do and we understand you work hard and, and you try to please everybody. But there are some things in here that we as a council, I mean, every single one of us has specialty or knowledge or experience you know, and beyond a normal person. I mean, that's what makes a collective council. But when we make suggestions, we're not attacking you guys. I'm, sa I'm just being careful, okay. So be that being said, w are you changing or doing any modifications on the food trucks? Because technically they are restaurants, even though they're not, you know, brick and mortar, but are you requiring them a business plan, staffing schedule, hours of operation, kitchen equipment, I mean, this is just, I mean, this is something that we want to eliminate as government, what you call red tape in everywhere, because you're, you're making the pro pro process longer than it needs to be. Uh, so that's the things we want to improve. We want to help you to make your job easy. At the same time, we want to acknowledge our expertise and our knowledge in that field to make this better. Understood. And what we're trying to balance is making sure it's easy with the protections we've heard that council also wants to have. So we will try to, to, to walk that line, okay. um, and we need to know from you what's what's essential to protect and to have the information, or what you would like to remove to make it easier to apply. I think if we're gonna ask for a business plan, we ask for everybody to provide everybody. It, 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 I think we have, our laws are supposed to be, an ordinance it should be that everybody has to comply the same way. And this is what causes problems, headaches, and this. And I understand that there are concerns from some people, but they're not the majority of the community. We have to quit tailoring things to the minority. There is a whole other world outside of five points. But but and, the, the yeah, and, and 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 it affects every business. So if we're going to do it, it has to be across the board. It cannot be in one industry. That's just not fair. And we don't want to discriminate against eating establishments, whether type one or type two or type ten. I mean. You know, it's it, it's we have to be business friendly as much as we can, um, and I don't think I don't think this is. Not okay, Krista, um, you're going to. We're not presenting tonight. Um, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we've got some time to maybe take into account for the yeah, discussion here. Yeah, we would like some direction and, on, on some of these items. Yeah. Um, if if, if there's a uh, need to follow up, to do. I'll be glad to sit with you and meet and, after Joe. Okay. Um, the only thing that stands out to me is uh, grandfathering with that. You know, that's that's a horse which several feet. So we good. But but may I put that, I mean, okay. let me just make clear. Uh, just because it's grandfathered in, I think it's still specifications or in, in adjustments. As if you are grand grandfather in. As Daniel said, if you're going to add a rail or add something to improve your patio, is that going to go in the front of it? I mean, this is something we want to discuss. As in, if you are grandfathered in and you decided to put a fan in your patio, that you're going to go in the front of Boza to get an exception? I mean, we need to be clear. That's that's what I'm saying in our ordinance. Yeah, and we'll point out, we'll, what we'll point out to you is our non-conforming provisions that are very clear. That, okay. that was one of the goals of this code is to make the non-conforming provisions um, and I understand a lot of this code, a lot of this language belongs to the state. So, okay, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And I, we, do, we do appreciate your hard work uh, on this. Thank you, Bruce. So, you, anybody has to do some follow up with it, just go ahead and do that. 
Wait, uh, to be clear, so this was an item for tonight, though, right? It was. We'll so we're going to hold it. Okay. So that'll be on the Actually, we'll just have to take it off because I'll have to go back to the question. Okay. Can we not amend it? What the, the amendments we're, we're talking about tonight would fall under the state statute of requiring the planning commission review. Hmm. And that's why we're taking it off the table. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, there is no rush for this, right? I mean, there's something that we're just being proactive about. Okay. Yes, we were just asked to bring it forward, so it's fine. Good. Thank you. We're proactive. We won't be rushing. I'm here all night. As they say. All right. Um, unified Developments Ordinance Review. So um, we, when we had the public hearing, we um, heard a few comments from that, but y'all asked for a work session to come back on the code. Um, I know that one comment, uh, one issue raised was about flexibility in the landscape ordinance. So I, I went through and looked and ensured that, um, so we've got alternative compliance remains, um, which allows for the standards, you know, if it's unreasonable and practical due to site conditions, those types of things. It's a staff committee that can review an um, alternative plan um, according to certain conditions, um, and, such as, uh, similar quality, consistent with the purpose and intent. So that's one area of flexibility. The other part of flexibility in the ordinance that actually applies code-wide, which we're really excited about, is an administrative adjustment. And this can be granted by the zoning administrator um, for any uh, numeric standard parking up to 10% and then up to 20% of any dimensional standard. So if you've got a setback, um, if you've got a other type of dimensional standard, the zoning administrator can administratively approve that variance. Instead of going BOZA. Instead of going to BOZA. Again, it's according to certain criteria, so it just can't be that Rachel thinks it's a good idea that day. Um, <laughs> Are we making that clear in, it's, it's in black and white so you can understand? Okay. So, you know, we had this discussion about palm trees. <laughs> I've been corrected that they're not palm trees, it's they're grasses. Yes, I was corrected the other day from uh, Sarah that it is a grass, not a tree. Well, that makes a difference. Yep, and so I said, well, how does that affect us on the landscape if you're doing a swap? Does it become the perception that we think it's a tree, or is it based on the reality that it's a grass? You can plant them all day long, it's just not going to count as a shade tree. Um, you know, we have certain standards for what a shade tree is. But I get, uh, but so that's that's the issue that we found on Rosewood is that we allow the university, we allow um, the fair, excuse me, all of them to plant that and count towards their their landscape. Mm -hmm. But yet we wouldn't let the guy across the street match and count that as part of his landscape. And so that's, do we, I didn't feel like when I read, I like the fact that we have different levels and that there is alternatives, because I think that's one of those complaints we get. Mm -hmm. You know, is there flexibility in having it not have to go to a committee and, and have an administrator make a, a, a call, I think it's great. But this type of instance, to me, that's where I didn't see the flexibility in there unless I read it wrong. Now, palm trees, and they count for one? Unit? Yes, they count, they count as part of your density, your overall density for your site, um, but they do not substitute for the shade tree requirement. So, so to can, use your example, I'm sorry, about the fairgrounds, they did plant uh, palm trees, but only after they fulfilled the shade tree requirement. So they interplanted. But there I would argue the fact is that both of those companies or things did the same thing Except they wanted to plant it out front, and we were told they were told they cannot plant those. They cannot plant them in the right of way, and then we, as the city, turned around and planted mm -hmm. palm trees right across the street from them. Well, and so this is where the, the 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 problem that I have is that is it doesn't seem that we have the flexibility either flexibility in the code or flexibility in the, in the ruling to help 
create synergy in those corridors, I guess is where I'm really going. Sure, and I, and I, I see how it can look up here that way, but um, the we, we, they can plant the palm trees. They just have to fulfill the street protecting yard requirement for the shade trees first. But so, in lieu of. so well, that's 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 where I would say well I'm a little confused by that because if I go out there right now there are no shade trees in that corridor on the university side or the um, um, fairgrounds right there they planted all palms all of their shade trees are within the parking areas and others they don't have them on the perimeter. Right, and the and the, that's that that that's the argument of why can why would we allow them to do the similar, which they had done at their other business, which is down the road, was allowed to do that. Right, that I think the uh, the palm trees you're referring to are the ones on the Bluff Road side, Bluff and Rosewood. So those Rosewood is in the right of way. That was our DOT decision. decision. That wasn't to fulfill our requirements. Planted those trees that I'm talking about. We just couldn't make the decision to, of what to plant there because it's not a right So, what we're talking about, we regulate the parcel. What he's talking about is the decision of the city of the DOT is what to do in the right of way, which is totally outside of what we regulate. But then, then we regulate and the why do we plant the trees, the, pop, the grasses, excuse me? I'm I have to get public works about that. But I mean, that's, that's, that's my point. I mean, I've got pictures of us planting those things right there, and that's why I was like, when I talk about the flexibility, I want to make sure that we're thinking about this because, you know, these are the type of areas where things being consistent bring, it, it, it looks much better if you're driving in and suddenly you've got this area that doesn't match the rest of the street. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I don't um, think you disagree. I just think, yeah, right. how, how do we fix that part? I don't regulate, the landscape ordinance doesn't regulate outside of the parcel. So anything that was outside of the parcel on the right but of see, way, I wouldn't have seen. That goes through the encroachment. But here, here well, there, really, so you really totally understand that if you go out and you look at their plat, they actually own out into the road because it's so old of a piece of property. They being the fairgrounds? No, is that the, uh, the, the Jay's Corner. The old oh, Jay's. Oh, that food is good there, too. So they're, I mean, they're probably, <laughs> <laughs> DOT is actually <laughs> encouraging they're on that. They're there, though. They're not here. <laughs> okay, so, so, and you, uh, but do I, so I guess the question would be is, in these type of instances, do we have the flexibility where Rachel or you or somebody can make a judgment call? Because I think that's one of the frustrating things for citizens today, is if, 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 if they call for water or whatever, is that everything is so black and white, and there isn't a black and white issue anymore. I mean, it is clearly everybody's in the gray area with every type of issue. Do, with this, does the staff have the ability to address those with flexibility so that we can move things along, that we're not sending things back to somebody or, or, oh, you can't do this. Well, let me look at this. I've got some flexibility. Is there enough flexibility in your belief that we can deal with people on a case-by-case -case basis? I would say yes, and and we've got a staff who wants to do that. Now, will we still make everybody happy? No, because well, if you if you figure that one out, then you need to write a book because I mean, you're going to be a retired. There will still be people who want to go further than we may be able or willing to in the alternative compliance. So um, that is certainly an issue, and I've really been appreciated these folks for their creative thinking and trying to get projects done. But there are some times when we need that shape tree. I mean, I I. I I have painfully, and I say that just because it, it's a lot to read, um, and it took me several months to go through it in the time. I did ask some other business folks to look at it. They all felt that it was a vast improvement for the city, um, so I congratulate you on that. There were just some things of where are those judgment calls and do, does this allow us to do that because we're going to have things that come up that don't fit. Even though I think y'all have attempted to try to come up with every scenario that is giving y'all a headache in the past of trying to solve, I just I just want to know that you feel that we have enough flexibility that y'all can make those calls. Yeah, there's there's both a, a lot more flexibility and also some enhancements that will make some of these um, relationships among our neighborhoods and our commercial districts easier too. So we hope that that will 
encourage development and to make these neighborhoods and business districts work better? Let me let me say that I, I haven't read every line yet, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I did go out to the uh, public sessions, moved around, and even the um, uh, the diagrams and, and so forth, a whole lot better. Uh, but I, if we can exercise the flexibility that that's intended this time, I, I think. Uh, it will go a long way, with especially some of the folks that are just not used to uh, the way we do business or don't fully understand. And I think um, I think we, we're headed in that direction. But, but I hear what everybody else is saying too. So if we continue along those lines, and, um, maybe some of the educational sessions might. Uh, further explain the difference between a palm tree and grass. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, one more. Um, the uh, the um, the workout place that is on Rosewood. I think that's something we've never addressed it in zoning before in code. Is that something that you guys have worked on to modify or? Yeah. So it won't be in this. As I mentioned um, at the last meeting, we've got a number of revisions that will come through between adoption and the effective date because the effective date will not be upon when you have second reading. Okay. It will be six to nine months out to allow us to do that mapping process. And so we have a number of revisions that okay. we will need to make and bring to you during okay. that period. That is one of them. And it probably will just be a spacing requirement. So um, be aware that that will be a spacing requirement from residential that we'll be proposing to you. Maybe come back door in front of We'll make sure to make that clear. OK, good. I, um, I, I, I haven't read a lot of this stuff. Uh, I, I think we should. Um, hopefully, we'll um, I think I know we're headed in the right direction compared to what we had. I got a thousand sticky notes and a lot of highlights if you want to cheat and read mine. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So we'll be Thanks. bringing it to you for first reading um, and second reading in August. Great, thank you. Thank you. And so the, the drinking is that, I mean, the food and everything will just be an amendment to that. So prior to, so this will go in effect on January 1, correct? We're, well, because we've been pushing this back, we'll probably be pushing that date back a number of months. So, um, but what we'll do is if you still want us to proceed with this ahead of that, this amendment, um, we will bring it back to you, and that will be one of the amendments to the new code as well. Does that make sense? Do you think we can get it on the next agenda? I mean, there's just a couple items to, to fix. Well, we need it to go back to, to go the back planning. To planning commission. It has to go to planning commission. Yeah, they're, they're significant enough. That. State statute requires that if, and it uses some term that's, I think it's significant, so it's not black or white. Um, but I would say what we're talking about is significant enough that planning commission would need to review it, so it's not subject to challenge. Okay. Could you do um, one reading? I, 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 don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with you that it's significant. It, it's, it, I mean, if you, if you read, read that, that amendment, there's a lot more detail. We're talking about, I, I would argue that it may not be significant. Well, if you take out the 250, it would be significant. No, it wouldn't. Why wouldn't it? That's one of the key things in it. Have you separate. read it? Yes. It, and how many other items are in there? It's this one little Yeah, but that's sliver. a key one. If you've got the 250 separation, which is what the uh, Coalition of Neighborhoods is banking on. Uh, oh, so that's what I can <coughs> okay. Actually, that, that was just proposed in the ordinance um, as... Oh, well, now, now we're getting into the <laughs> feedback from. Now we're getting the feedback from. If they from. liked it, this uh, is right. all amendments. Uh, no, that was that's been in the code ever since we had that. This, uh, okay, why don't, why don't we just... But see, I think a special exception is, is a better way to do it, but that's just me. What we're going to we'll do is, is we'll, we'll work on some amendments, and um, we'll work you with can, you, you all can, you to can consider that also. And, and, and we'll get back okay. as soon as we can. All right. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Krista. Do you get no reprieve now? Anything else from it, Krista? <laughs> okay, our next yeah. item, number four, alternative payment of fines. Ms. L. Matney, Parking Services Director. Um, this is a idea that Mayor Benjamin proposed to staff. Um, 
So I really felt like we needed to bring it to the work session so we can make sure all the council is understanding what the concept is. Um, I haven't even delved into all the ins and outs, so Elle, if you could walk us through it, I would suggest that we tighten up the time um, frame for the proposed um, moratorium. So anyway, take it away, Elle. Thank you, City Manager, City Council. Thank you for allowing us to be here. First of all, who is excited in the room that Parking Services is bringing something fun, fast, friendly to Columbia? Raise your hand. Oh, it's a field shop. I knew someone was dumb. Well, that is, I didn't expect that from you at all. <laughs> this is a great concept. Oh, my Lord. I'm capable of that. <laughs> Donations for citation. While we can't solely own the idea, the concept, it did come out of Las Vegas. Um, we want to champion, bring it right here to Columbia. And perhaps thereafter, um, start a phenomenon with other parking services um, throughout the country. Today, though, who's going to do the presentation for us um, is Jessica Argo. She is our new business liaison. She's been with us about six weeks. And she's going to run through and tell you about the program, um, what we're going to do similar to Las Vegas, and some modifications that we are proposing, and then we'll take your feedback. Did you, did you see this in operation in Las Vegas? I have spoken to someone in Las Vegas. Their operation is much, much larger. <laughs> I wish we were filling up a tractor trailer, um, but it's been very successful. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I would just like to introduce myself. My name is Jessica Arco. And um, oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, Donations for Citation is a back to school supply drive um, put on by Parking Services in the City of Columbia. Upon City Council's approval and resolution on August 6th, uh, the kickoff should start on uh, August 7th. Anyone receiving a City of Columbia issued parking citation between August 7th through the 21st may satisfy their citation by bringing new unwrapped unused school supplies of equal or greater value to the parking fine amount including the receipt of the citation and um, the receipt of the school supplies to the parking service location on 820 washington street uh, across from the Columbia police department uh, our office is open monday to friday 8 30 to 5 30 p.m Final donation date will be September 4th, 30 days after, uh, close, close, I'm sorry. Uh, again, foundation donation date will be September 4th. Citations must be received within the period of August 7th through August 21st to be eligible. Citations received prior to August 7th will not be accepted and are excluded. Actual donations do not begin again until 7th, August 7th um, only pub, non-public safety citations will be satisfied during the program. Citations below will be excluded, such as traffic and moving violation issues by CPD are excluded, handicapped parking violations, residential parking permit violations, parking in per, improperly, parking in no area parking zones, double parking block driveways, loading zone violations, reserve parking only. We will be accepting donations such as pencils, pens, erasers, um, we are looking at maybe also um, publicizing um, local um, school districts uh, supply list as well. Donations uh, received will be delivered to Why Not YouTube, which is a local nonprofit here in the Midlands. What's, what's the name of that? I'm sorry, uh, the donations received will be delivered to and donated to Why Not YouTube. YouTube. It's yes. at the bottom of her, of their handout, the very bottom. I don't think we've got the uh, question. Uh, oh, did you write that one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's got it. He's got it. Um, so, the, so, the, sorry, go ahead. so the ticket then, you get a parking ticket. You go out and buy supplies, present your receipt, and numerically it has to amount to the receipt. Yes. Well, now, Tolman is not on here, right? <laughs> 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 
Is that on that? If there was an individual that had received um, an amount of citations that would enable them to be towed, they're still subject to be towed. What we don't want to do is create bad behaviors. So I just want to go out and buy school supplies and I want to create unsafe parking situations. We don't want to create that even though it's just two weeks. Um, in the future, it could be a lengthier period of time, but you would still be subject to be towed. If you run down to Target and you purchase $215 worth of supplies, I'll waive those citations if it's in the time frame associated, but you would be responsible for the tow list. So it's only the, the citations that are given between that date of uh, 6 through 21? Yes. yes, sir, 7 through 21. And it's a two-week period, and then you have an additional two-week period um, to make the exchange, the donation. So Mr. So Redman couldn't use this to pay off his past fines. He has to use it to close in that window by that window. That would be correct. Okay. So if you have received citations in 2018 and 19, you can't present those for an exchange. I, I can't find anyway. So <laughs> during the window. Are you yes, putting values on these items? Or? You this being our, our first annual, we can't put necessarily um, a price tag. We don't know what to expect. If it'll be a handful of folks, um, where it'll be numerous. The most common citation we expect is an expired meter or a timed meter citation, and those are $8. Okay. But the receipts are the value of the item. Correct. So but the, the receipt would then? be the minimum, so the receipt value would need to be $8. If it was 10 we're only taking off $8. You don't get a $2 credit. So you have to bring the receipt with your school items? Yes, sir. All right. Let me, let me make one recommendation. I think handicap parking violations should be off this list because handicap violations should not be exempt for anything. But anybody that parks in a handicap violation should be paying a big fine every single time. It is excluded. It is excluded. Right there. Oh, it is? Excluded. Excluded. <laughs> the list um, that oh, it is excluded. Never mind. Okay. Right. <laughs> We're blocking a driveway. We don't want to create a okay. Well, right. okay. okay. I'm, I'm assuming that, that parking services will do some sort of PR campaign to yeah, okay. this. Yes. Are y'all going to put that in with the fine? <laughs> we have a lot. It, the only reason I say that is you almost have to have something that you're putting in with that envelope or that ticket because we, what about all the people who... I'm just worried that you're going to get contested if a guy from out of town has to write a check and he finds out, well, I could have given... I could have gone to Walmart on the penny day and bought, you know, even X amount. Uh, my question was, since you're going to do a PR campaign, which I think would be good, why don't you include in that that while you're at the Washington Street office, you can get one of these passport things, not passport, but the um, smart, smart cards, okay. which is the cheapest way to park in the city of Atlanta. You mean the reason why I don't get parking tickets anymore? That's right. Oh, very nice. That that is a wonderful invention, and not it's the greatest people, gift I ever got. That nobody takes advantage. Of. Not enough people take advantage of it. Just be an opportunity to get that before you. Or you could tell your clerks when they come in with the notebook paper, say, "Why are you here? Why don't you?" Where are people dropping these things off? The At the parking services office. And we're going to house them there. So with um, uh, great success, we'll have everything housed in one place, and it will have more of a media, a wow factor, when we collected all of these things. Um, and we'll be tracking financially, um, Jan, um, so that um, when we are on the back side, we will know um, where this can Well, it would certainly be good after the 21st to give us some idea how that tracked itself out and, and how it looked at the very end of the program. Let me ask you this. Once all of that is done, we're going to deposit those items with who now? Why not you too? It's a local organization, nonprofit. We worked with in the past, um, not associated with parking services, but with fireflies and book bags. Um, I, I believe the city has worked with them before, and then they will distribute um, throughout Midlands schools. Okay, I was going to ask that. That was the next question. How that, how, why not YouTube? Okay, once that's done, how do they 
how do they identify the schools that you're going to be uh, doing that year? Is it in districts or uh, how does that work? I, I couldn't answer that question um, at this time, but we certainly want to be aware of where the school supplies are going. All right. We'll have that answer by August 6th and know exactly where they're going. Okay. And, you know, uh, photo opportunity and where the school supplies end up and how they're enriching our local schools. Oh, um, we won't be uh, sending out a water bill between now and then. Oh, yes. This is all scattered, right? Oh, yeah. We always set out water bills. Would that uh, <laughs> 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 I, I guess my, my question is, does it, <laughs> is there an advantage uh, maybe next year if you do it to uh, include the notice? Promote it. Absolutely. And I think it will grow um, momentum. I think that's a great idea. And hopefully there will be other communities, um, even though, again, we won't own it. What a great cause to champion and encourage other communities um, with regards to parking, because as we know, it can have a negative connotation. But when you are doing something positive and giving back to your community, warms people up. Not that they're ever warmed up for citation, however. Do you have a good PR name for this campaign? Why you no. Thus far, um, we're calling it donations for citations. Okay. We're, yeah, we're there, open to ideas. Is there any way we could, uh, you know, folk, folk are around the county building paying their taxes? Of course, uh, vehicle taxes. And of course, Still got to feed the meter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, <laughs> no exceptions. No. Don't stop. <laughs> Is there any way, as a part of the PR campaign, to get the Richmond County building or some pamphlet over there? Yeah. Some handout for persons. Um, they're paying a. I mean, if, t if their car is a ticket engine, um, it's almost like an engine bill. So you get ticketed, then you go and pay taxes, and then you get a ticket. It may, how helpful would it be to have some information in the <coughs> as a part of the PR campaign? Yeah, are, you, are you asking that? them to make sure that people know that they can donate? Well, that's going to be a part of it. That's going to be a part of it. Or your concern is that's going to be as a excuse me. That's going to be a part. <laughs> that's going to be a part of it. And I think in elongating the uh, the PR campaign, that could very well be a very important. Well, is that something that's going to go out during that two week period with the tickets? Is there something that's already going to be attached to the ticket? So whatever, it, whether it's the county building or wherever it is, if you have, campus, right, if you have something at the time of the ticket is issued, then people will know automatically, I guess, to Mr. Rickman's point, too. And to know that there's a cutoff. So right. you can't receive a citation and then yeah, for that the period of time. Mm -hmm. When you've incurred late fees. Okay. Very good. Sounds good. Very creative. Let's do something for Christmas too. Oh, love it. <laughs> great one. One program at a time. I was about to have a heart attack. Yeah, thank right. you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Elle, so much for your willingness to do the program. And nice to meet you. Thank you all. Thank you. Welcome aboard. All right. Jeff. Homeless services. All right, our next item is the coordination of regional homeless services and the Implement Weather Center Service Agreement. Um, Ms. Melissa Kaufman, Budget and Program Management Director, will take you through a few of the changes. If you recall, when we brought the contracts, um, just a discussion of continuing the various contracts that are on your council agenda this evening for homeless services. There were several suggestions from council regarding, um, particularly with the uh, United Way as our coordinator and service provider, um, just a few tweaks as far as the focus that needs to be placed on certain areas. And so I really thank um, Jennifer, I know in particular she probably worked on this and is here to work with Missy if you have any questions. And thank you, Sarah, for being here also. Um, but they've really tried to work through addressing some of the items that you asked about before. 
I know Mayor Benjamin's um, not here, but he was um, very interested in this item too. And I know Chris is here to take some votes for him and Tammy. So at, at this point, right, if um, um, Jennifer Moore, you know, the way he's here at the moment. Sarah Fawcett, CEO, this Jennifer is here to address any questions that maybe you have regarding the um, two contracts. There's actually four items on your agenda tonight for resolution for approval related to the home services contracts that the city has for different providers. As Ms. Wilson mentioned, um, we did bring up United Ways Regional Coordination of Homeless Services, and that's, that's one uh, resolution. Second to that, is, or second contract also is with the operation of the Inclement Weather Center. And there's just a few tweaks um, that have been made to services provided, as Ms. Wilson mentioned, that have come through, through various discussions with City Council and with the City Manager over the past year, um, as well as United Way, in terms of adapting as we kind of go along with regards to the services they're providing and the different focuses for each year. So those items were attached to your um, items on the resolution, but Jennifer's here to sort of just get an overview about them and answer the question. Good afternoon, Council City Manager. How are you? Good. Um, can you just a very quick overview? Um, so again, we have worked with staff over the past year and then also spent uh, some time at the March uh, Community and Economic Development Committee meeting, talking through this as well, and also working with our vendors and partners in the work. Uh, so just give you a few updates of the things that we're proposing. Um, I'll start first with the Inclement Weather Center. I think that's the most minor of the changes. Um, for the IWC, of course, that's the cold weather shelter serving adults from November to March. Um, the biggest change that we're going to suggest there is changing the vendor for the transportation. So we've worked um, through the first five years of operating the center on behalf of the city um, with a private company doing the transport. Um, they've done very, very good job, very high quality services. Um, this past year, we did start talking with the Comet, and we feel like they can deliver an equivalent level of quality of services but at a lower cost. Um, so we are recommending moving that vendor choice uh, to the Comet. Um, the other thing, and we, we talked a lot about this in the March um, uh, committee meeting, um, I know Reverend McDonough, you were there, Mr. Davis, um, about um, the, the Inclement Weather Center really was always structured to be a very bare bones uh, facility, so shelter and last resort for people. And so it doesn't provide any kind of staffing for case management services or triage. And that's one thing that we do very specifically at United Way is our role in the community is to really triage people who are experiencing homelessness and get them to the appropriate housing and care that they need. Um, but we just don't have that level of staffing at the IWC. And that concerns us because the folks coming to the IWC many times are people who are living in very challenging situations and they only come in for shelter um, when it's very cold. So we have worked with partners all along. Um, we've had very strong partnerships with folks like Mercy, uh, the Mental Illness Recovery Center, 180 Place, um, our Public Defender's Office, um, to have um, folks there to help us with that triage and screening. Um, since then, we've also talked with the uh, USC um, the Housing First Program, which also is one of your vendors in the city work, um, about po possibly having some of their folks down there to help us with the triage. Um, they're closed Friday afternoons, so their staff are there till seven during the evenings, um, Monday through Thursday, so that might give us the opportunity um, to extend that partnership a little bit more within the city, the city work um, and offer that triage that we really need there. So that, that's the two major things with the Inclement Weather Center, so I guess maybe just pause and see what questions um, or recommendations you have there. Can you expand on the Comet's um, transportation services as far mm -hmm. as the time, if there are any changes of location, and or pick, like the pick mm -hmm. where they're picking up from? Um, yeah, so times would not change. Um, it's still the on demand starting at 545, running for an hour uh, up until 7 o'clock, um, with the requirement that they do need to come back if there's folks waiting at 7 o'clock to make sure that they pick up. Um, so that has not changed. Um, what we have talked with the Comet and we've talked with city staff um, and, and CBD about is actually moving the location from the pickup um, from the current Clean Up Heart facility, which is behind your, your Metro uh, headquarters here, across the street to the Comet's uh, location there at the com uh, corner of Laurel and Sumter. Um, we think that's better in several different reasons because um, if, you, if you've been, um, if you've looked out the window at 6 o'clock, you know that there's a lot of overflow into the street because there's just not a lot of room for people to stand, um, especially um, on nights when it's raining or, you know, even other kinds of precipitation. 
you know, we, we just didn't feel right about that. So we think having that opportunity to move, to give them something climate controlled, a little bit more space so they're not spilling into the street because of lack of place to stand, um, we think that's a better move for us. Well, Jennifer, you know, I think, I think you know that uh, my concern back in March, of mm -hmm. course, um, was the whole idea of that triage mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. and how important that is. Mm -hmm. Partic I mean, it's, it's important, period, mm -hmm. but particularly during the months where we experience real cold weather and inclement condition. So that cri triage support, and I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, mm -hmm. and moving forward with that, I think it's going to really help us a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, we totally agree. So at United Way, um, separate even from the city work, our role as the lead for the local homeless coalition is to do that triage for the community. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a vulnerability screening instrument that screens for um, length of homeless, um, health conditions, um, other kind of factors that would kind of prevent them from um, accessing being successful in housing, and then we actually run a prioritization list sure. of people so that we can make sure we get the people who are most vulnerable at the top of that list into our very limited housing resources first. So what we really want to do is, again, expand that more to the IWC. It's just it is very limited not having case management staff dedicated. So just saying that to bring that to your attention, that's sure. something we want to do, but we're, do, we're trying to be very creative with partners to make that happen. What a homeless court, too, is. Mm -hmm played a tremendous, I mean, they're sort of helping lead the way yeah. in terms of that triage approach. And yeah, that's, we've, we've been that's so encouraging. proud of Homeless Court. Um, we worked with them from the very beginning. It's, it's going in and out. Okay, I'll speak up. Um, very proud of the Homeless Court. I mean, now they're spreading to Myrtle Beach, Florence, um, you know, talking with the county about possibly expanding there. So it's, it's really amazing what Homeless Court has done. Thank you. You, were, you. you mentioned about you know the triage work, case workers, and everything. In the past, at least in the beginning, I know that you know. Last time I counted, I think there's 60 odd groups that serve some role for the homeless mm -hmm. and, and folks in need. So, are, are we able to continue those partnerships and, and, and help them in there? So is that something that y'all are able to, to encourage them to come to the shelter to be part of? Or did, are you looking for another space to get more room for that? Or? No, I, I think we have, we have space there. And again, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak up. Um, we have space. And we have had very strong participation from partners. It is after hours, so um, so it is partners working with us to make sure that they can accommodate their staff schedules uh, to do that. But we've had strong participation. Um, beyond just the case management, um, we were really happy this uh, this past year, we had a hepatitis A and flu uh, clinic on site from DHEC. Um, and we had about a third of the folks who were there that night actually participate in the shots. Um, and the, the way we actually got that success rate, because it's a pretty high success rate if you talk to, to DHEC, um, you know, hosting a clinic, especially in an open space like that. Um, we had our, our providers down there to really engage people and sell the concept of getting the shots on. So we've had good success there. Um, it's a matter of just working with each individual agency, figuring out what funding source they're using to pay for their staff, if that's, if that's an eligible activity that they can do, and making sure that they can accommodate it for us. Jennifer, y'all do a terrific job, and I appreciate the briefings that several of y'all give for the coalition of downtown neighborhoods uh, on the Fridays we had at Dale and Cooper's all year long you're doing this work. Um, I read an article on McKinsey and Company over the weekend on San Francisco and the problems they're facing with homelessness and how it takes multiple groups working together from different ways just like you have described to get a control of this uh, situation. I sent it to Missy and to Teresa. Uh, maybe they can forward it on to y'all, but it, it, it's a larger problem than we've got, but it's the same type of uh, solutions, people working together, multiple groups working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, we totally agree. As, you know, we see ourselves as a convener of strong partners, and so we totally agree. Jennifer, a lot of discussion we've had, you know, during the course of the um, contract about you know, some of our more challenged individuals that are 
you know, kind of frequent flyers, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. as far as um, whether CPD having to engage, whether there are mental health challenges going on. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the emphasis on that and if there are any changes that will directly impact that. Yeah, sure will. So moving on to the regional contracts. So the, the second contract is the regional coordination contract. Um, so just a couple very quick changes there, and then I'll get to exactly to the city manager's question. Um, this past year, we um, instituted a travel voucher program. So um, folks who um, had an opportunity to return to their home community, um, that we could verify that they had family or friends that would able, be able to accept them there. We did um, partner with Transitions to have that. So that's bus tickets, basically, to your home community. Um, we had 67 individuals take advantage of that uh, amazing program. We've had only three that have returned um, that had issues that made them return back, so we were very pleased with that. Um, in, the, in the new contract that you'll look at this evening, we actually proposed increasing those resources slightly um, because we ran out of money about nine months into the contract. So, um, and, and, and fortunately, staff let us move some money around so we could continue that on. Um, but that is one thing is the travel vouchers we felt very strongly about. Um, one thing in the contract we want to um, decrease uh, emphasis on is really our, our housing coordination. Um, so we um, had established landlord networks kind of working very one-on-one, -on -one, uh, working with landlords to get them to um, you know, overlook kind of blemishes in the past, whether it be credit or background issues when they're looking to take on renters. Um, we found that to be very good work, but it, was, it, it didn't have the opportunities to bring to a systems level. It was just very one landlord at a time, matching with one provider at a time. And we really felt that we could reposition our staff to be more effective with the city resources. Um, so what we would like to reposition to is our frequent offenders work. So um, in November of 2017, we started working with City Center Partnership, with um, CPD, with the Solicitor's Office, the Public Defender's Office, to look at those individuals on the streets um, that we believe were homeless and had high interactions with law enforcement. And um, we, we started with a list of 74 individuals. Um, we then prioritized folks based on um, individuals that were having just high re-arrests or high complaints, especially in the Main Street area. Um, and then what we did is we worked very diligently with our outreach staff and our street outreach workers um, to really review that list to make sure everybody was connected with a service provider. And we were doing that housing triage to make sure that we were screening everyone for housing. What we found with this group of individuals is this was a very challenging, very isolated population. These were people who, um, on average, had been homeless for um, a long time, had been through a lot of different services, and getting them to interact with another service provider again was challenging. So breaking down that barrier with them really was very important. So we um, you know, have a, a weekly team meeting where we go through the list, and then we follow the providers. We have a formalized outreach meeting uh, monthly where we go through the list. And then we meet um, every other month with our core team, which includes the solicitor's office um, and North and Metro region of CPD to go through the individual listing of individuals. So um, what we've been able to do with that original list of 74 is we have 16 folks um, in housing, so stable housing. Uh, we have three who've been able to return successfully to their home community. Uh, we have two that had just very um, compromised medical conditions, and so now they're in a, an appropriate long-term care facility and unfortunately, one individual has passed away um, from his, his time on the streets. So um, it, it's very challenging work. Um, I know we handed we, we had a handout that we did back in the March meeting, and I brought another kind of updated copy today, if you'd like me to share. Um, that we did kind of present a couple of the case studies that we, we work with. Um, each each situation is just very, very challenging um, of, of folks, and um, working just very carefully and kind of piecing those those puzzle pieces together to really figure out what the solution is for that individual. So what we're proposing with the regional contract, again, is to diminish that housing work a little bit and really focus on the frequent offenders list to make sure that we're screening and we're triaging our most challenging folks. Can you give any statistics on how much that, did you say 71? It started with 74. Said, mm -hmm. Did you get any statistics on how much public money that 74 incurred while they were being bad on the street and going to the emergency room and not like not that. those 74 now we've done so um here at united way we manage the homeless management information system so that's the the database for if you say it transitions or if you're working with an outreach worker or social worker we record your case management notes so we have a very rich database of history um on clients that goes back um 
roughly until 2007, 2006. Um, of information, and we have done a couple different reports. We're happy to share um, that we've looked at healthcare utilization of people who are experiencing homelessness and found tremendous use of public services um, and private services. And then we've also done a, a report on youth homelessness, um, looking at um, trying to map the pathway that young people experience early in life that leads them to homelessness later on. Um, but we'd be happy to share that. We haven't looked at the 74 in the public usage rate, but it, it would be certainly interesting research for us. Sure. The one comment that I got an email about, I'm not sure of anybody else, that do we have a food committee or mm -hmm. are we do okay? Yeah, we sure do. So uh, Kathy, wait, wait, wait. Kathy's our homeless services coordinator and Jeff Armstrong is mm -hmm. our uh, youth coordinator under the city grant. Um, but Kathy coordinates the meal share committee um, that we've had since the very start of the, um, uh, the city, the work with the city. Um, so they have a steering committee, a leadership committee that meets monthly and then on quarterly months we have the larger group um, so we invite participation we had a great meeting this last month with um, the supervisor of park of your uh, park rangers from Finley um, to really get on the same page about how they issue temporary permits if someone is um, you know, doing a meal without a permit I'm sure I'll do a, a generous policy of issuing a free permit so you just need to, you know, to, to take them up on that um, so uh, we do meet there and so I have updated meal share calendars for you I'm happy to share um, what we have done is since we started this work is we've been able to um, combine 11 of the meals um, and we've had three and back so really a net, a net decrease of eight meals and that's really just through helping people understand who's doing what to um, prevent duplication of services. Okay. I just got an email about it not too long ago and mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I answer her correctly. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone's interested, just connect with us and we'll get them approved. We'll do it. Mm -hmm. I'm, just glad that, <clears throat> I'm just glad that we are collaborating with each other mm -hmm. and that um, lives are being changed because of that. Mm -hmm. Again, it was good for me to hear that whole piece on triage. Mm -hmm. um, you and Transitions and the Homeless Court, all of those persons have played an integral part in making sure that those brothers and sisters out there are, are dealt with and assist in a real creative and positive way. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're moving step by step, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Thank you. And mm -hmm. be remiss if we didn't uh, do a special thank you to um, the Columbia Police Department, Chief Holbrook and his staff. Um, we get tremendous support from CBA. Sure. We really do. Um, we, you know, to the point where if we're looking for someone who we've triaged and you know, prioritized for housing, and we can't find them. You know, we, we will send an, you know, we'll send a text out to a, you know to one of our captains, and they will respond to us. I'll have three officers call me within 30 minutes. So, <laughs> so it's wonderful. We really appreciate just the, the very compassionate approach that they they, they play with us. In this. I was on that note. I was chief is in the building, but I want to make sure, particularly before tonight. I, I mean, it won't be any issue with the way the contracts put together, Jennifer. But I do want to make sure I'm really clear about this um, drop off pick up and mm -hmm. then the pickup site moving across to the transfer station. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just because we, we, that creates a lot of resources all the time, I mm -hmm. think that's probably fine. The other issue that I want to make sure they're clear about is the through the evening continue pick up and taking to the IWC, IWC that the police department has to do because that creates a lot of burden on and creates a burden on their resources so mm -hmm. um, we just I want to make sure we're really tighten that up and make mm -hmm. sure that they're comfortable with the setup with the comment I don't know mm -hmm. if the comment has any ability to I know that specified time frame but mm -hmm. we tend to continue to pick up after seven o'clock and we, we've had several conversations about that, um, both with our vendors, with transitions, and also with CPD to kind of understand what would work. Um, so pickup is ends at seven. Um, if folks again, if folks are waiting, we require that the transportation vendor go back and pick them up. You can't just say, well, you're seven o'clock, we're done. So they are required to go back. Um, but what we found is that some folks, you know, do want to stay out a little bit later. We talked with our vendors about moving that to maybe eight o'clock or so, but it really kind of created disruptions with the meals and then the staffing patterns. And then we felt, well, if you move it to eight, then you have to move it to nine, and then maybe it's 10. So I think what CBD has done is very smart. So what they do do 
is they uh, implemented this can past get, year. Can we, officer? Can you get the chief to get it? To listen to this. <laughs> I'm like speaking for everybody today. So, chief, we're talking about the um, the pickups that your officers do after the buses run for the IBC. That we yeah. don't like to do. We don't like. Well, I've been here trying to speak for y'all. We don't like. We think it's a very expensive taxi, and your services are, are better to use somewhere else. Um, so the we, we believe that. So seven o'clock is the pickup. Again, the van has to go back. Um, we think what Captain Roberts especially had done was very smart this past year is that he'll do a pickup at 11 and then one at 1.30 and he'll have people just basically wait so that one van can take versus taking multiple officers off their, their duty to do that. So we thought that was a very good adjustment. Um, we are open to any suggestions. Um, you know, I've talked with Craig at Transitions many times about this. Um, you know, we will accept drop-offs 24 hours a day. It is, it is disruptive because, you know, you're opening the roll gate at that point. People are sleeping, so for the, you know, for the, the safety and, and sleep patterns of everyone, we really prefer not to have drop-off after 11, but if it's an issue of people on Main Street, we have colder weather conditions, if that's the choice, I mean, that y'all are willing to transport, we are willing to accept them. So, or we're willing to do really whatever the city would look vicious to do. Well, I mean, I just, I know we're putting on contracts. So I want to be clear tonight for the council's purposes on what is or isn't going to work before. It, I don't, if the language is very specific, then mm -hmm. that's what we're going to be held to. There needs to be some kind of tweak to adjust for how y'all think it's best to do it. Then we need to talk about that before. Yeah, is, I mean, is there a recommend, I mean, is there a suggestion or a recommendation for us? Because we're, we're very open yeah, within the resources that we have. Yeah. Does it need to be uh, sweet? So, so what are we talking about, the after hours? Or after the, hours, the, what your, your, your team does. Well, I mean. You the, seem to have some the reservations. Well, the, the issue is, is the strain it puts on our capacity to mm -hmm. provide service to, to, to everyone else mm -hmm. uh, when we're tied up on this and um, you know it, Captain Roberts has you know been able to I guess you know do some workarounds mm -hmm. with you know, doing the band tying up you know one officer as opposed to individual officers and it's humanitarian really and and, and safety issues at that point and it's usually on extreme weather um, nights, but and that's a van at certain. It's, it's one of the CPD vans, and um, 11 o'clock and 1 30 is my understanding is when Captain Roberts does that. So, again, you're taking one vehicle and one officer versus multiple trips. So, he'll, so what the officers do is they'll basically tell folks to wait at the drop off point until the designated time. Um, and so, and the comet couldn't do that. I can certainly talk with uh, Mr. Ando and find out what their ability is um, to do that. Um, that wasn't the original conversation, so, but I'm happy to do that. The other thing we did is we worked with transitions and periodically, um, about every six weeks, we would look at the list of the people who uh, were frequently dropped off and they would have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them to talk about the, the wise use of resources. Um, so we did have a few, few behavioral modifications there, but it, it tended to be a, a smaller group of people within the larger context. Well, then let me show kind of. And y'all are good with the Sumter Street, the, across the street drive. Yeah. The well, so, you know, I, I'll let Captain Roberts make that, make that call. Uh, he was not opposed to that. Um, and really, it's, to me, it's, right. it's negligible because you're literally talking, you know, 50 steps across the street. Mm -hmm. um, but the added, I guess the one thing that, and I'm assuming that the thought behind it is we do have additional security at Central Street now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's going to be um, different a different bus than people who are in their normal course of their day trying to. It'll be a regular common bus, it, and they'll have a special signage for Inclement Weather Center, but it'll, it will look like the regular buses. But I'm saying it's not, it's going to be, y'all work, have worked through how that will be integrated with their normal operations for, we, yeah, for, yeah, for they citizens. Would, right, they would integrate it again. With, to Moving the location, and, and we're, we're fine saying where, where it is. I mean, it's, it's up to the city's wishes. 
Um, for us, you just have more landscape for people to stand on, so hopefully we won't have people spilling over into the road, because you will have people with their belongings and also physically, you know, five or six feet into the roadway on Laurel Street, and, and it could be, you know, it's a safety hazard for them and also drivers at this point. Right, and you'll have that on the other side of the street, too, immersed mm -hmm. with the people who are trying to take the but I'm just trying to... I end up hearing about everything later, so I have to ask the questions. So I just want to make sure that the citizens who are trying to, at 6 o'clock or between 5.45 and 7 o'clock, get home from work or get where they have to go, that it is not an inconvenience yeah, and for them. We've talked through with the comment again. You know, We're happy to do it even as a trial basis, and then if it's not working, move it back over. Um, during the year, we had talked about even maybe trying to move the pickup location inside the parking lot more and then having the vans run through but then we thought that might impede the access of the metro police officers being able to leave and get to their cars and things like that so we have looked at some different possible solutions um, i think what the city has done they um, did <coughs> the, the bushes and the brush that was behind the clean parts building i think that's been a very positive change um, so you have more site visibility there so i think that's been a Okay. Well, I don't belabor it anymore for now. If council approves the contract as it is written, I just wanted to have the flexibility on these mm -hmm. two particular issues about the pickup and yeah. drop well, off to have, make have some yeah. adjustments. Yeah. Okay. Um, one quick question. Yes. Okay. Quick. Um, how much resources are you are you using to do that to transport transport homeless? A lot. Well, it was. It, it was um, 900 pickups last year. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's extremely disruptive. That's it's that's why he, you know, shifted to using our transport vans instead. Of, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just we were just constant ferry service. Mm -hmm. It was considerable. 931. Look at the language for us and bring it back. Does it matter if you hold it another? No, I mean I I think we've got. And as long as there's flexibility to address it in the best way, I mean, I I take ownership that I didn't ask these questions of the staff. I thought maybe y'all had worked through this before. Yeah, and we also talked the transitions to see if possibly they could use their van after hours to make room, and that was not a possibility they felt like they could do. So we've we've, we've had different conversations to, to try to be creative and, and still open to other solutions too. Well, trans so, transitions has not been. They've not had. They're not willing to do any additional transports. Well, no. They don't. They don't have a staff person that works. Um, well, that can drive the van. Well, this, this I know, issue, but that's so. the. But we can say that too. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, I mean, they just conveniently. But but I'm just saying it's it's so, we, you know, we don't. The 900 transports is not something we would have preferred to do, but it's something we have to do because we're doing. We if we don't transport it transport somebody then we're going to deal with that problem throughout the night even at night so. uh, yeah i'm, I'm uh, just sensitive to city managers concerns and i'm hearing whether it's negative or not negative or not there's an impact as far as uh, cpd well what i'm saying is neg what i'm saying is negligible the difference will be whether they're standing in front of clean hearts or across the street in front of the, the Train station. Yeah. You know, there's been great effort with pretty decent success in the last you know, year or so to police the transit area and distinguish when somebody has a legitimate purpose to be waiting for public transportation versus somebody that's milling around, you know, up yeah. to nefarious activities. And yeah. you know, that, that's been, been successful. You know, I, I would be fine. You know. It always complicates things when, when we do the inclement weather pickup because it, it puts a heavy concentration of folks in, in the vicinity. But um, you know whether they're across the street or you know on the transit side, it's still you have to manage those people. Okay. Yeah, I've been in the mix with cats and bus uptown, so I kind of know how that works. Based on this conversation, are we comfortable with? Contract as is. With the flexibility. With the flexibility. She, said, she said, yeah, she's just got the flexibility to work with it. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. That completes our items for the work session discussion. Um, second session motion is in
We have a pen right now. The division will go into executive session for receipt of legal advice related to pending threat or potential claim 30-4A7082, Nicole Brown versus CLC. Receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by a client privilege pursuant to 30-4A7082. Massage call is Laura Richardson. Okay. So, Mr. Favor. So, thank you. Thank you. Are we going upstairs or are we going to call the call? I'm going upstairs. Yes, sir. Upstairs. She got them all. Yeah, we're working. Put a record. Say hi. Hi. Give her an eye. 